Good evening, everybody. Um, just like to thank the institution for having me here tonight at the start. Um, as, a, as it was said, I'm a Cormac Mee uh, from ORS. Um, I'm a chartered engineer. Uh, I studied here on Bolton Street, and it's been 14 years since I was in this room. Uh, so I'm, I'm back, and it hasn't changed at all. Um, I uh, went from here to uh, a company in Mullingar. I wasn't sure I'd end up down there, but a company called O'Reilly Stewart, who uh, now trades as ORS, uh, and currently the director of the company there. Um, we're a kind of a mixed background practice. Uh, we do a lot of various things, um, civil and structural and fire safety and uh, kind of building compliance work. Um, so kind of our background, our broad background, kind of led me to decide uh, prior to the car coming out, that it was something that we should be kind of in that zone of, you know. Um, so I was kind of keeping track of what was going on uh, at, the, at the consultation stages of BCAR <coughs> and trying to trying to see where it was going to go. So just tonight, um, this little guy, I've been talking about this to be honest with you since since it came out. Um, not long after it came out in March, we did a, I did a presentation. Um, and this guy kind of came out with us and uh, pulling his hair out, what do you mean I can't use my new building? And ultimately that's the, that's the risk of the building control regulations. If you don't do it correctly, you can't use your building. And um, Many of you probably know there's no, there's no real way back. Um, it's not like planning. It's not like you go into the, 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 the local authority and look, uh, look for uh, them to accept um, what you've done. There's, there's, no, there's no method for it. Um, and I've only kind of heard of a few instances of where people have had to do that, um, and I don't. There's, there's, there's some building control officers maybe here tonight, and, and I've spoken to building control officers. But what do you, what do you do? Um, I have heard one story where the building control officer basically asked people to design something from scratch to get a whole new, whole new team of pe whole new team of people in uh, to design structures and other things, and cross check it against what was originally designed to make sure it was okay. Um, but there isn't actually a, a, um, a system for for backtracking when you haven't done things right, right with BCAR. So just what I'm going to cover tonight is just the background and the context um, to the building control amendment <coughs> regs, uh, what changes the amendments brought in, um, a little bit about the code of practice, um, a little bit on the culture of compliance. Um, I'm going to talk about the actual role of the assigned certifier and what we've done over the last uh, 18 months, uh, a little on risk assessment, um, talk about inspection plans, a couple of small case studies just to kind of go through some of the teething problems we've seen, and then what next for us all in the industry. So the background and the context, um, that's uh, Stardust Dis Disco Fire, <coughs> which happened in 1981, um, and uh, you know, there, was a, there was deaths, and that kind of triggered something. And before that, I mean, if, if you look back at what we had in terms of legislation, you go back to 1878, and we had an SI41, which is a Public Health La Act, which, which brought about <coughs> bylaws. Really, there was only bylaws in urban areas. Um, so we had, a, we had a large period of time in this country where there wasn't really any control over what we did in terms of building. And uh, it was all brought to a fore with Stardust Disco Fire in 1981. Um, and on the back of that, this Fire Services Act was brought in. Uh, it took another nine years for the Building Control Act to be brought out in 1990. And Following that, the building regulations uh, initially brought in in 1992. Um, that's actually where ORS were set up. Uh, the two guys, the, the OR and the S of ORS, uh, decided, oh, here we go, building regulations. This, 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 is, uh, this is going to be some work for engineers to, 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 to go into practice. So that's where they set up the company on the back of. Um, but we joke at the moment that what they thought was coming in was actually what's only coming in now. So it's taken tw nearly 25 years for, for us to come full circle in terms of what they saw building control being and what actually was, was, was brought out, you know. Uh, so 1997 brought in the revised building control and revised building regulations. So there were some uh, iterations. From 97 to 2007, we had the Celtic Tiger that we all know about. 2007 was the Building Control Act. It was also the, the time when the pyrite issues were identified, which is another significant uh, occurrence in, in, in building control. Um, in 2009, we had SI351, 2009, uh, which kind of gets overlooked a little bit, but that was the original BCAR, or, or Amendment Regulation to Building Control, 
uh, and that brought in some some key changes um, around DA, dis disability access starts, which were always there in the overriding legislation, but um, only came out in 2009. Mm -hmm. It also brought in regularisation certs and revised fire safety certs. And uh, the, cr the critical one that, that a lot of people miss is the revised fire safety certificate. Um, that came out in that, in that, in that SI or in that uh, amended regulations. But if you make significant changes to a building that has a fire safety cert already in place, that you need to apply for a revised fire safety certificate. Um, and there's that, from what I've seen over the last 18 months, that aspect has been missed. Um, and I think there's consultants out there trying to get a, a, around that, not realizing that, you know, maybe they shouldn't be. Uh, now it is quite vague and it's down to interpretation. The, 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 the legislation uses the word significant. So what's a significant alteration? My my idea of significant might be totally different to any of yours, um, but I mean if it's if it's a significant alteration of what was originally applied for in the fire safety cert, uh, then you need to go back to building control or the fire fire authority in, in, in the case of fire cert to get that checked again. So that's just something to point out. Uh, 2011, then of course we had Priory Hall, uh, again a huge issue around fire safety. Um, 2013, then we had SI80 which was the, the original attempt at BCAR, which was subsequently revoked after a, a kickback from the industry. Um, I know there was certain working groups set up, um, both from the professional bodies and from uh, the constru construction side, from the builders themselves, and uh, they brought out some pretty big, big guns to, to show the minister that it was totally wrong uh, what he had. So then 2014, we had SI9, as we have it at the moment. And then, of course, last week we had uh, SI number 365 still written in, in pen on the front cover. Amazing. It's so new. And it's BCAR number two regulations, <coughs> or BCA number two, or as I've written it there. So the second attempt. Building control regulations, just to say, wh what, what are they? Because there's a, you know, there's, there's a bit of confusion around what they actually are. They're the matters of procedure and administration and control Okay, for the purposes of actually securing the implementation of the requirements of the building regulations and demonstrating how compliance with such requirements has been achieved. So really they're all about procedures as opposed to rules or anything like that, but the procedures of control. And this is one of the key things out of the Building Control Act, that buildings must be designed and constructed in accordance with the relevant requirements of the building regulations. So as soon as you start designing a building, you should be designing it uh, in accordance with the building regulations. So at scheme design stage, you know, building regulations should be brought into your designs. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that's always the case either. So that affects everyone. That affects the building owners, it affects the designers, architects, structural engineers, services engineers, fire engineers, speci specialist designers, and the design server, which we'll come on to later. Um, and now I think what BCAR has brought out is that the builders are starting to realize these obligations to design and construct. Um, I've seen a lot of architect architects' specifications over the years, and one of the first things it says is the work should be constructed in accordance with the building regulations. And it was always kind of a kind of a cop out. It, they just pushed it all over to the builder, you know, and say, well, if you don't build it, you're not building it in accordance with the building regs. Um, and now, of course, we've got the assigned certifier. So, what does it actually apply to? <coughs> um, Building control amendment regulations applies to the design and construction of a new dwelling. Um, or at least up to last Tuesday, it applied to all dwellings. Now with the BCAR 2, it only applies to multi-unit dwellings, housing estates. Uh, single units have been have been uh, given the option to opt out. Um, we we'll probably have a discussion about that at the end, I'm sure. But uh, I'm not sure it's a good idea. Um, it also BCAR 2014 applied to the extension to a dwelling greater than 40 square metres. Again, since last Tuesday, that's got the option of opting out. Um, the, revi or the, the, the amended regulations on, on, on Tuesday also clarified the issue of the 40 square metre rule, um, which was whether, whether it was cumulative on all the extensions you'd, you'd built or just the one you're actually building. So the answer is, it's just the one you're building. And then finally, works to which part three of the building control regs apply. <coughs> so works 
to which part three or part three is the section of the building control regulations that sets out your requirements to do a fire safety cert uh, or a regularization cert or seven day notice and disabled disability access certs so basically if you need to do a fire safety cert for the works you need to go through this procedure using bcar and again there's this the question of do you need to uh, are you, are you, uh, do you need to do a revised fire safety cert um, under building control legislation there is exemptions for certain works or, or there was certain works so an office material alteration to an office or an industrial unit or a shop you could you didn't have to do a fire safety cert but that was that's going right back to the original building control uh, regulations under the new amended regulations if it's significant revision that question has to be asked so what was the aim of the changes of, uh, that were brought in with BCAR so a key aim is for regulatory oversight and the purpose is to ensure a culture of compliance with building regulations and it uses a risk-based approach to target those who are non-compliant. So I asked myself the question, if we're trying to ensure a culture of compliance, we probably didn't have a culture of compliance in place. And I think, you know, talking to people, we didn't. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about culture later on. So the aim is that the powers of enforcement and prosecution will become a more credible threat to those who are non-compliant. At the moment, I'm not sure that the threat really is, is, is credible. Um, I mean, we, we talk, I'll talk about inspections from local authorities, but I don't, not, not sure that that's seen as a credible threat yet. Um, and I, I'm not sure that's, that's something that, that, that forces people into doing it just yet. But ultimately, the aim of the, the amended building control regulations is to ensure, and this is, this is the way it's written, better quality of building constructor, construction to provide safer, more energy efficient and more sustainable buildings, including our homes and places of work and other buildings. Okay, so we're just trying to make buildings that are safe and sustainable and energy efficient. So what changes came in in BCAR? There were new roles, the role of the assigned certifier particularly, and uh, another key role that's kind of sometimes lost in the mix, you know, everyone talks about the assigned certifier, but there's a role for the design certifier. And they can be the same person, but um, what we're seeing is that pretty much on, on, on larger projects where there's an architect involved, the architect is taking that role of design certifier. Um, <coughs> and what they're doing for that role or in that role ranges from absolutely nothing to s except, except signing the cert to absolutely drilling down into every single nut and bolt of what every single consultant is doing. Um, so there's a, there's a happy medium som somewhere in the middle. Um, there was a new commencement notice form brought out. The one before, I used to, the odd time filled in commencement notice forms and really it was just something that you scribbled down a few notes on and said, hey, we, we better let the, the local authority know we're doing something here, you know. But now it's, it's, a, it's, a, proper, it's a proper form that gives proper information to local authority to allow them to, to understand what's going on and let, allow them to carry out risk assessments. Uh, there's notices of assignment. So now the builder and the assigned certifier are formally uh, given notice um, of their roles by the client, so the client has to sign and assign these roles. So it's 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 making the making the own building owners and, and clients and developers start to think about what they're signing and who they're appointing. Um, schedule of documents, schedule of documentation. Um, again, it's paperwork, but it's starting to get people thinking about what are we actually doing? What what documentation is being generated? Um, what documentation do you need on this project? And we've got document submission now. So documents get submitted to the local authority. Um, I know they don't do anything with them, except hold on to them. But at least they're being put up there now. They're in the public realm. Um, you know, three, four, five years down the line, there's something wrong. They sit, they sit, I mean, I always use the, uh, the example of the films. You know, the, they, go to, they go to City Hall to, to get the blueprints of the, 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 the building to break out or whatever, or to break in. That's what we're gonna have now. If, if, there's, a, if there's an issue with a building, we can go to we can go to City Hall and we can go to the building control office and say, listen, I'm after buying this building and it's in trouble. Can I pull out all the, the historical files on it? And uh, it th that information should all be there. I don't know what the the procedure for that is. That's I haven't had to do that yet. I'm not sure uh, how you would go through that procedure to do that yet, um, and how you would actually uh, show your interest in a building in a few years' time. But I don't think anyone has to go through. Anyone has gone through that yet. So we also have the online assessment 
through the building control management system, which uses risk-based based approach again to highlight to the local authority what the project involves. So is it a, is it a one-off house or is it a very large six-storied timber frame building with high risk? You know. Um, we have inspection plans and inspe inspection notification framework. Um, language we didn't have a year and a half ago or 18 months ago and we've had to get thinking about. We have the code of practice uh, for inspecting and certifying buildings and works um, which I'll go through in more detail later on so I won't comment on it here. We have certs of compliance for design um, which the design certifier uh, certifies. We have an undertaking by the builder and the assigned certifier so people are formally undertaking to do these roles now and they're having to put their, their professional membership against this or their in the, in, the, in the case of a builder, uh, and I know it's only um, option at the moment, but the CIRI registration. We have ancillary certification, so there's a series of um, a cascade effect of certification now, where you have documentation backing up everything that's to be done, or everything that's to be designed and, and, and installed in a building. And finally now we have defined level of local authority inspection, so 12, 12 to 15 percent of buildings are going to be inspected. and. This goes back to the, the, the thing I said earlier on about the threat. Is it really is it really a threat? I'm currently I don't think so, but they are inspecting because we've come across projects where they are inspecting, um, and they're using the my understanding is anyway they're using the risk based approach to go and carry out those inspections. Um, but at the same time, we've seen them coming across various different projects. So, like I won't say they're just going to visit the big ones because we've seen them on, on some very small projects as well. Um, so it's, that's that's good and it is there and I think that that needs to be kind of highlighted, to particularly the clients that that threat is, is is a growing threat, you know. So what has not changed? We always talk about what's changed. What has not changed? Um, the building regulations haven't changed. I've been asked so many times, what about these changes to the building regulations? You know, I mean, even the minister. I've heard a minister talk. The minister talks about the, the building regulations changing. You know. Um, and the cost, the, the, the CIF speak about the cost of the building regulations changing, you know. Um, yes, things have changed cost-wise, but probably because we weren't doing things right. So it's a cost perception. It's not necessary that the, the building regulations have now changed, but we have, a, we have a regime in place where people are starting to build to the building regulations, <coughs> you know. We're starting to build houses now that you can't hear your neighbour in the room next door. So oh oh now to put extra plasterboard in the walls. It wasn't. It's not extra plasterboard. It's just what you should have been doing. So it's it's that's a that's a huge um, <laughs> misconception, and that's unfortunately the one that the public sees. So we as professionals probably understand that. But from a public perception, uh, and you hear it on Joe Duffy, and you hear it on Morning Ireland, this thing about the cost of building, and it's it's what generated uh, the revised building regulations. I think last week, you know, it's a misconception of of of, of what's required. Um, so there's still a requirement to submit commencement notices for all works to which the building regulations applied. Okay. So the original building control regulation said you need to submit a com commencement notice for all works to which the building regulations apply. And that includes those projects like the material alteration of an office shop or industrial unit. And I had an architect ring me there a couple of months ago and say, can you tell me, do I need to submit a commencement notice for this work I'm doing in this office? And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, we're changing it all around and we're putting in new air conditioning, we're doing all sorts of stuff, we're putting in fire up. I said, does it affect any of the building regulations? Of course it does. Then you need a commencement notice. Oh, crap. <laughs> and then he says, but this is probably the 30th one of these I've done this year. I says, yeah, that's the 30th one you should have submitted a commencement notice on. <laughs> you know? And he said, right, better go back and tell the client so. But it was only a short form of commencement notice in that case. There was no fire cert. Um, and I thought there should have been a fire cert because it was a pretty big substantial change to a, to a thing but um, they, they had decided it didn't need it so they submitted a short form of commencement notice. Um, there's still a requirement for fire certs and disability access certs. As part of the, um, the consultation period I went up to uh, one of the, the meetings um, that the department had and I asked the question well if you're bringing in this, this system because they were talking about what it was going to be I said, surely you're going to take away the requirement for fire safety cert and DACs now, because why would you have to apply to a local authority for confirmation of two elements of the building control building regulations when now you're going to have a system where everything's lodged? And they said, oh no, but fire and fire and access—they're very important. They're they're, they're very important. And I said, well, I'm 
structural engineer by training, and I think if the building falls down, that's pretty serious, like, you know, and they, they, you might have no answer for that, but why why they have this two-tier system now around fire certs and disability access certs, and that has to get signed off, because all it really does is it checks the design. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that what's built on site is any better, that still has to be checked independently, so <coughs> um, that's something they could have looked at perhaps, but, and, and it may have freed up resources as well, because building control officers are being inundated now with, especially even say that in the, in the urban areas, as things pick up, disability access flying in for all sorts of things, offices, fit outs and everything, and they're in looking at these disability access certs when they could be out on site actually doing part of their 12 and 15 percent inspections. Um, we all know the fire starts are, are done by the fire officers anyway, so um, that's kind of separate to that. But uh, as I mentioned before, um, the requirement for a revised fire safety cert for significant changes to granted fire safety certs. But then the building control system ultimately is still a self-certification system. So the person who signs off on the building still gets paid by the building owner. So ultimately, he's still cert self-certifying. Um, there isn't independent, fully, truly independent uh, certification like you would have, say, in the UK, where a building control officer comes in and actually inspects the designs and actually inspects the works and signs off and says, yeah, that's okay. So we still have a self-certification system here. <coughs> and there is still the risk that, you know, a, a, a dodgy cowboy builder could employ a chartered engineer who wasn't so worried about his, his membership and get him to sign off on all sorts of stuff and then liquidate a company and then he goes off to work somewhere else in Australia or whatever and does that have the does that have the the the, um, the backup then for the client and uh, I haven't certainly haven't heard it heard it happening and I, I think ultimately it's, it's it's underpinned by the by the uh, professional judgment of the of the the, uh, the, the various professionals uh, and what else has not changed? There was still a process for applying for dispensation and relaxation to building regulations. And I think this is something that people may not even have known about. I mean, I, I just putting this together, I, I just threw my eye back over all of the kind of the, the standard documentation that's used on a project. And if you look at the Engineers Ireland or ACAI um, uh, 9101 certs, that's one of the questions or one of the things that you, you, you fill out at the bottom. You know, was there a dispensation or relaxation applied for and give details of it? I've ne I'd never applied for a dispensation or relaxation before in any project. We just designed around it or whatever. Um, but I've over in the last but in the last year, I've seen I've seen that come more and more. Like I've said to people, well, if you can't comply, this is what you can do. There's a route. There's something you can take. Um, we're we're looking at a project at the moment um, where it's a route we're going to we're going to we're going to take, and it's a pretty big route. But it's there's certain there's certain reasons why we're, why we're going down that route. Um, but we're struggling to we're, we're tied between two two kind of two stools, and we're we're we're, we're, we're uh, we're not able to comply with something, <coughs> so we're going to go down the route of applying for dispensation, and we may we may get thrown back, and we may have to come up with another solution, um, but uh, we're going to try it. So just to just to mention the, the building regulations, then. Um, so these are like the rules, the rules of building. We had earlier on the building control uh, regulations are the administration rules, but the building regulations are the actual rules of building. How do we build something? And we all know there's parts A to M. Um, so what are they for? As I said before, the health, safety, and welfare of people, <coughs> um, the special needs of disabled people. Um, I know that's slightly changed now in the in, in the latest part M, where the word is just is just access. It's access for all. Um, but that's highlighted, and I suppose that's one of the reasons there is the DAC is that this was highlighted as in the original. This is from the original Building Control Act that there is a special uh, a special need, or there is provisions for the special needs of disabled people. Um, Obviously, the next one, the conservation of fuel and energy, is a huge one in terms of uh, the world we live in. We're trying to maximise our resources, um, and that's as it says there, the efficient use of resources. And the last one, I, I, I think the last one is good building practice. You know, so encouragement of good building practice. Um, one of the one of the part one of the one of the uh, the actual building regulations is Part D, materials and workmanship. And like, how often is that used? How, like, you know. People don't understand. Like, the workmanship is a key part of the building regulations. You know, it's good building practice. But who looks after that? You know, snag list at the end. Sure, what can you see at the end? And you just take off a list. But making sure that throughout the throughout the the, the 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 building project, that good building practices is being brought through. Um. So as I said before, 
to check the, to check these rules, there's a fire cert in DAC, which is a local authority check. It only checks the design. What about the other key requirements? So for the part A, the structural engineer, there's no cross check. So we're engineers are taking all the taking the risk themselves. Um, and then you've got the new role of the design certifier, uh, and they're the person that certifies that the bu that it's building regulation compliant. Um, but what measures are they taking? So if, if the architect is the design certifier, what are they what are they actually doing to, to make sure that all the rest of the elements are actually com compliant with building regulations? You know, are they are they actually drilling down? Are they are they are they asking the structural engineer any questions? Are they asking them, well, what have you done? Um, or are they just saying sign the, sign a bit of paper here to tell me everything you've done is okay? So the code of practice, just a little on the code of practice. Uh, this was eagerly awaited when it came out. I know it came out in draft format originally. Um, and uh, people getting it and there was this conversations about it and people were like, oh, where does it say what you have to do on site? You know, how many inspections do you have to do? Um, and then people were a little bit disappointed. It, it was a, it's a very good document. I don't know whether everyone, everyone has gone through it in detail, but it's, it's, it's a very good document. It sets out very clear guidance on the roles and responsibilities uh, of all the various parties. It sets out very good details on the paperwork. But when it comes to the stage and inspection, the words here are appropriate professional judgment and risk assessment. So it did, doesn't tell you what you, what you should do um, because that has, to, that has to be project specific. And so this is some of just some of the language that it uses. So it's really quite vague, but like reasonable and appropriate interventionist measures to ensure quality outcomes. You know, early warning of non-compliance so as to build in regulatory responsiveness. Empowering third parties to positively influence compliance with regulatory requirements. Encouraging all participants to achieve good outcomes and re recognizing that while the legal requirements set minimum standards which must be achieved, there should be an ambition to exceed these. I got forward halfway through reading that, you know. Um, but yet, if you look at it, there's some really good words in there. Um, like early warning of non-compliance. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we need. Um, and encouraging all participants, that's, you know, the minimum standards or the building regulations are, are, are minimum standards. You know, like take part L for example. For for um, for houses, part L at the moment is, is is really quite good, but it could be better. You know, and and um, we should be we should be sort of achieving more than that. Um, the, the currently, like if you if you try and do a standard house at the moment using using deep, you'll probably get an A three. In by twenty twenty two, all our houses have to be nearly zero energy which is still only going to be A3, but it's going to be a slight improvement on where we currently are in terms of uh, CPCs and EPC levels. But we should be trying to aim as high as we can. Um, so there's certainly, there's, there's certainly like, we can do better in terms of the building standards that we have. You know? like we've just had the sound uh, part E has been updated, you know. In terms of sound, you go to most apartments in Dublin now, you can hear knock on your wall to talk to your neighbor, you know. So there was, there's a long way we could be going. Um, but I would say that if you haven't read through that code of practice, take it, take it home and, and, and read through it over a couple of nights because there's, there's language in it there that as professionals you can st you pull out the good words out of it. But there is a lot of stuff in it, um, you know, basic stuff, but there's, there's, some, there's some very good stuff in the, in the, in the, in the start where that, where, the, where that language is that sets out what the, the, the regulatory design sort of requirements are and what we're trying to do um, as an industry to, to improve um, the quality. So a little bit of the culture of compliance and changing the habits of a lifetime. Can we can we change those habits? Um, do we have a good culture of compliance? I would say we didn't. Um, what we've seen and what we've what has happened to us, we've had we've had the, 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 the boom bust. And I think the bust has been very good for this country in, in one sense, because it has set us back a little bit and made us all sit down and given us all time to, to, to look a little bit. And this was it, it was it wasn't great. People were, a lot of people were out of work, but those who maybe were were still working were weren't just as flat out as we were in the boom times. And we've been able to have a little a little pause and a little look at what we were doing, um, and improved our improved our understanding and our knowledge around um, what we were, what we were building our clients. So who needs to change? I think certainly the clients and the building owners and developers. Uh, they need to change and understand that this is here now, and it's 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 <coughs> it's it's for their good as well. Um, designers certainly need to change. Um, contractors absolutely need to change. I mean, there's there's some some contractors out there who are embracing this, others who 
are trying to do anything to get out anything to get out of it um, subcontractors for me this is one of the bigger ones because you have contractors who put, who have systems in place but then they employ subcontractors and ultimately um, as I say here at the bottom like a construction project is made up of many parts constructed by and designed by very many people um, in a structural engineering office you might have your project director who starts off the project <coughs> all the way down you have technicians you have engineers designing various bits then the drawings go out to site or they go out to the contractor for pricing they go through a QS team they price it all up they go out to all their subcontractors then it comes back and then there's a contracts manager and he's trying to build it as a site engineer and he gives it to the subcontractor and the subcontractor goes out and there's concrete works being done and you got to go to all the way through the chain but ultimately it's the guy putting the rebar in to the into the into the shuttering if he doesn't do it right then it's not going to be done right so all those people from the project director in the structural office all the way down through the contracts managers doesn't mean anything all those systems if the guy putting it in isn't doing it right um, and I think that's one of the key things to, to, that I've taken from the last <coughs> 18 months is, is the culture between uh, builders and subcontractors to understand what their roles are as well you know so obviously local authorities have to change as well um, and they are doing a lot of work um, to upskill themselves and, and, and get out there and do inspections and then certifiers have to change and certifiers probably are designers and contractors in the old sense and now maybe are people like myself who are coming in to try and do a, a third party certification but in terms of certification we have to stop this just just signing for the sake of it you know and if something's wrong something's wrong and putting the systems in place to make sure that um, things are highlighted in advance so that when it comes to the end you can actually certify it I mean I think construction is the one industry where where, where everyone else th or everyone know, thinks they know better you know you got a client who comes in and says no no we're going to do it this way but I'm the structural engineer I went to college for four years to study this stuff and I've worked for 15 years designing stuff and you're telling me I'm doing it this way you know and you wouldn't you know you wouldn't go in and tell your mechanic he's wrong you know you just go there, there you go 400 euros yeah thanks very much you know um, so really um, the point I'm making here at the bottom is this third party inspection uh, and independent <coughs> oversight and peer review is where this has to go you know um, and at what stage is then well, I'm suggesting from conception that, that nearly as soon as you're starting a project you're starting to think about how is this project being going to be compliant you know now that's not, I'm not saying you need an assigned certifier from that stage but within the process of the design you're starting to think you're designing around around uh, around reg compliance and regulations and it goes right through the handover and I think there's probably a small link to the PSDP role there uh, in terms of what a PSDP has to do in terms of coordination of paperwork and design elements I think that's getting lost in the in the in the mix as well like they do a lot of similar similar things in terms of co coordination of, of design um, but that's not it's not been it's not been seen in, in, in the industry so just on the role of the assigned certifier <coughs> everyone surely knows this at this stage but to be an assigned certifier you must be a chartered <coughs> engineer or a registered architect or a chartered building surveyor provided that you are competent in relation to the particular works involved so I know from Engineers Ireland, Engineers Ireland has 6,000 odd chartered engineers. For sure, I read the Engineers Journal, and most of them are medical device engineers or doing something else. So, are they really competent to, to, to um, work as an assigned certifier in relation to certifying building works? Um, but ultimately, it's the building owner's responsibility to appoint uh, the assigned certifier who is registered and is competent. So, that goes back to the conditions of engagement and, and uh, the assigned certifier. Um, shown that he is competent <coughs> I'm somewhat biased I'll say engineers are better best to do the role but maybe that's just because I'm an engineer but um, we were chatting beforehand and uh, like there's a lot of architects who won't do the role and I think that's somewhat down to the this thing of risk risk profile so engineers are we've been signing off on stuff for years and pretty risky stuff especially structural engineers <coughs> so we sign off on the foundations and we sign off on the structure we sign the, the, the skeleton of the building which is the bit that holds it up, like I said earlier on, whereas the architect just signs off on, you know, the interiors and the carpets and things. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can take on the risk, but now they're being asked to take on the risk that we had, whereas we're saying, well, we're, we keep our risk and we take on your risk because your risk is no risk, you know. But it's not, it's not, as, it's not as straightforward as this. But I think 
engineers kind of look at things systematically and they, they, they put a plan in place. And this is what this is all about, inspection plan, setting out, you know, what do we have to do? What, what are the key things? I mean, I, 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 love, I love what I do. I love, in, I love buildings. I love talking with people and, oh, how are we going to build this, you know? But <coughs> my, my initial training was structures, but um, I go beyond the structures. I, I, I want to know how things are being built, facades and interiors and all that. How does it all come together? So I think most engineers do, to, to be honest with you, I think most engineers will sit in a, in a, in a, in a project meeting and they won't just, they won't just uh, worry about their structure. They, they'll, they'll feed into the process. I've seen it in lots of things. Engineers like to feed into the process for things they're not even involved in. Okay, so I think that's part of why engineers are probably the, be the, the best focus for doing the role. Um, so just to say, is the design certifier must also be a registered professional as well. Um, and you can be the design certifier and the assigned certifier, as I said, and there's many people out there who are doing that, engineers and architects. Um, in, in fact, on a lot of the public works projects, just with the way contra uh, professional contracts have been set up, the, the, the opportunities for independent uh, assigned certifiers don't really exist because the architect is given that role. But what you'll find is, I think what's going to happen is that, like the fire consultant, which kind of became a, a separate entity um, under public works um, professional contracts, they'll probably pull out the assigned certifier at some point as well. And I've seen it on, 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 on some a couple of case studies that, that, that it is where, where there is an, in, an independent assigned certifier. But a lot of the time at the moment, any of the tenders you'll see will be for lead architect who fulfills the role of assigned certifier as well. So what does the assigned certifier have to do? Well, two things actually from the code of practice. One, you have to inspect and coordinate the inspection activities of others during construction. And two, certify the building and works in completion. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Just go to site a few times and then certify it at the end. What do you really have to do to, 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 to get that done? Because first of all, you can't expect what's not designed. You know? Um, and that was one of the things that, that, that I saw from the start, we did a few kind of small projects at the start to see how it would pan out, a few <coughs> even one-off houses, just to see how is this thing going to work out, you know. But when you actually start thinking about what has to be inspected, and you realise what's not designed, and that's why it scares me when I think about the, the opt-out, um, the ability to opt out now in one-off houses, because one-off houses are the one things that don't get designed. How many one-off houses are there around the country that were built off planning drawings, or built out of the bungalow bliss book? You know, and there's no design done. Um, like work that I've done over the years has been going in to inspect issues in houses, and I've I've said this. I said it with chat, we're chatting earlier on. I've seen some pretty horrendous things. Most of the time, they were in one-off houses. You know, roofs roofs just ready to go like that, cracks in walls, all because of methods of building or ways things were built. Um, so if it's not designed, you can't inspect it. Um, and I think even just to go back to, the, to, to some of the things the department put out there as part of their review, um, they, they had costs, I don't know whether anyone saw the, the documentation they had where they, they estimated the costs for doing the role of the assigned certifier. They had like 100 and 150 euros or 230 euros or something additional cost for the design, design, the design elements of a house, you know, actually sorry, the design elements of the foundations. And I, I tweeted, I, I tend to tweet on, on the, the building control thing, I tweeted, you know, what about all the other elements? What about part L and all the sound, all the various elements? The only thing the department worried about was the foundations. Really going back to like 20 years ago when, when the banks just wanted someone to go out and make sure the ground was okay and after that it was grand, you know? Anything else above ground could be fixed, but just make sure the ground's okay, you know? Um, so a design gap analysis is another thing that you might do as an assigned certifier. Like if it's not designed, do your gap analysis. What needs to be designed? <coughs> and that should probably take place with the design certifier because ultimately they're the person who signed the cert that says, well, the design is okay. But as an assigned certifier, if you're going to work with a team, you have to sit down with them and say, well, listen, have you designed all the various elements? Um, carrying out a design compliance risk assessment, again, with the design uh, certifier, looking at those elements that are designed and saying, well, you know, what's the risk? Are they, are they, are they really compliant? Are some really risky elements? Are we doing something that's very different? <coughs> um, then you want to determine the appropriate level of inspection for each element to allow certification on completion. 
um, and that, that, builds, that builds your preliminary inspection plan and your in inspection notification framework. And then identifying parties for inspections with, the, with your design team and with the builder. Um, some people think that it's very easy to identify the parties. Should there be a structural engineer, a services engineer, and an architect? So that's it. But it's not it. I mean, if you break down, as I said earlier on, every building into its constituent parts, if you have all the subcontractors and specialists, you might have a window, window specialist, a cladding specialist, um, a truss company, you might have a, a precast concrete slab company, all the various elements coming together, um, and they may or may not need inspections. So that has to be identified. So just, these are some of the things I, I kind of pulled out um, in terms of doing a risk assessment as an assigned certifier. Uh, I was trying to kind of keep it in, in, in the context of what people who are in, the, in, in structural engineering might, might, might think about. Um, but this is coming from the assigned certifiers side of things. You know? So in terms of the elements designed, uh, are all elements designed and who's responsible? Roof cladding, for example. Who, who's designed the roof cladding? Roof cladding is mentioned, roof and wall cladding is mentioned in part A. Okay, part A, well that's the structural engineer, is it? You'll find that the, the structural engineer will probably say, well, we'll take a very simple building, portal shed. Portal shed. <coughs> He'll design the, 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 the rails. But after that, what happens? So is a Kingspan going to design it as, the, as a supplier of the roof cladding? Balustrades, handrails, things like that on stairs. Who designs those? Is it the steel guy making them down in the shed in Roscommon, bringing them up on the truck to Dublin, putting them in the apartment blocks? He's just making them in a shed. So who's really designing them? Um, and what, what are the actual drawings that show that detail, you know? Um, are the responsibilities assigned correctly in accordance with conditions of engagement? Mm engagement? -hmm. Are there conditions of engagement for design team members? Does it talk about PI levels? Um, ultimately, that's what covers us all here is PI insurance. Um, are there specialist design elements? I mean, is there piles? Um, what level of inspection and testing is required? And is that being done? And is it identified in the construction spec? You know? Um, are those specialist design elements covered by insurances and warranties, or do they need to be? Has that question been asked? As the assigned certifier, you'll need to know that. Um, are there inno innovative or bespoke designs? I mean, are we doing something funny, or nice, uh, bespoke balcony detail? I mean, look, we saw what happened in America, the balcony collapsing. Um, there's all those apartments that we built in the building times in Ireland, there are hundreds and thousands of balconies in Dublin. You know? And if you look around any of them, you see a lot of corrosion. I've seen a lot of you when it happened I was walking around Dublin and I just you know, you just look up to see. Now I don't think we've any timber balconies in Dublin, but I won't I won't say there isn't any, but um certainly like there's plenty of those issues out there. Um so if they are innovative or bespoke, how is the building regulations compliance demonstrated? Is it that, that it's someone in the design team is saying, well, I'm going to make this design? The structural engineer says, oh, I'll, I'll design up a bespoke detail for this. But how is that actually designed? Is he taking the risk for it? Is that a high risk? Basement waterproofing. That's another huge one. Who signs off on that? You know, is it the structural engineer? Is it the architect? Is it the specialist? Is the contractor actually contracted to come in and get a specialist to sign off on that? At the moment, probably. That's probably what's like we've learned enough think at this stage to say, well, listen, there needs to be a specialist on this. Um, has there been a, a, a building regulation relaxation or dispensation identified? And has an application for it been submitted or and, approved and or approved or rejected? Um, <coughs> building regulation compliance matrix. This is a document that I started putting together very, very early on because, uh, and this is what we use to, to kind of understand where the project is going. So that there's only so many regulations. So if you can identify all the regulations, and break them down using the matrix to say, what are we actually doing? Does it actually, does it actually apply? And sometimes you, you do projects and you realize that actually half of the building regulations don't apply. You know? If you're doing a single, single dwelling house, sound, for example, won't apply because you, you don't have any adjoining, uh, adjoining um, dwellings. If it's a renovation project, you might have structures doesn't apply. <coughs> you might not have to do anything at all. Um, competency of the builder, that's a huge one. You know, is the is the builder competent to do what he what he's supposed to be doing? And who are specialists and subcontractors, and are they competent? Um, one of the big issues is you don't know who the subbies are until well into the project. You know, you could be building structure for twelve months, and the, the main contractor is going through negotiations with his, with his three or four cladding cl 
cladding contractors and none of them will give any information about anything until they're appointed. And they're appointed two weeks before they start on site and suddenly we're on and it's like, let's give us let's give us documentation, you know. And then the understanding and willingness of the subbies to design and inspect and certify their work. Um, as I said before, I think it's the, <coughs> the subcontractors have a lot to learn still and uh, I think the industry has to work with them to get them to, 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 to understand what they need. Is there site staff? Um, something I'm always looking for now is a BCAR coordinator on the contractor side. So who's your BCAR coordinator? Uh, right, you know? Someone to, someone to actually sit down with the subbies and say, this is what we need from you. Someone to take what we're giving you, them as part of tender documentation and say, right, we have to do all this stuff now. Is that included in your tenders? Um, is there an RE or a clerk of works? Um, that's, that's one of the, it's one of the things in, in, in uh, Engineers Ireland and the scope and the conditions of engagement and what, what we do as engineers to advise the client on, on the need for site supervis supervisory staff. So between the design team and the assigned certifier, you need to identify, is the project big enough for an RE? Do you need an RE? Do you need a, a staged RE for certain works? Um, come back again to like, you know, a large reinforced concrete project. D does the terms of engagement of the consultant engineer include for inspecting every single bit of rebar that goes in there? <coughs> they might, the client might think it does, you might think it doesn't. You might go out periodically, but is that enough in terms of inspections? So maybe the answer is an RE, you know, even just for that period of time. And that will obviously minimise risk then in terms of inspections by the assigned the certifier. And then project timelines. Um, we've seen small projects and they are just, what do you do? You have 21 day turnaround or you do your three weeks prior notification. What if your project is two weeks long? We've been asked to do fit out things that, you know, assigned certifier fit out projects that have literally been turned around in a couple of days. And then you're supposed to have 21 days beforehand or, 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 or lodging up. You send in a com commencement notice and then you're sending in your completion documentation the next day. We're going to be finished in two weeks, three weeks. And then you've got very long programs, um, only 18 months on. So uh, any of those big, big long projects we haven't finished yet. I don't, and no one's finished one yet. So it's make, to make sure that there's a very set um, systematic way of doing it so that that's carried the whole way through the project. So that when you get to the end, you can actually sign off on it, you know. So just on the inspection plan, everyone wants to know about the inspection plans. What are the factors in determining the inspection plan? And this is this is coming from the code of practice, but it's really the type of building, the type of construction, and the expertise of the build, builder. I mean, is it a one-off house, or are we building <coughs> we building developer housing? Are we building timber frame apartment blocks, six stories, like Priory Hall? Are we building a ten-story hotel uh, hotel block? Um, and again, is it steel? Is it concrete? What 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 are we actually doing here? Like, you know, if it's steel, maybe you just maybe you only need to be there periodically as they erect, erect and, and before they, 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 they close in. If it's concrete, maybe there's an RE, as I said before. Um, how complicated or straightforward the method of construction is goes without saying. Recent experience indicates current problems in interpreting or achieving compliance. Look, we, we go back to timber frame, timber frame housing and, and all sorts. We had, we had serious issues with timber frame in this country where it was just not done right and just the, 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 uh, the people on site didn't understand what they were doing. Um, like the, the, the buzzword at the moment in Partel is airtightness. Up till five years ago, airtightness didn't exist in the industry or, or, wasn't, or wasn't, it wasn't focused on. Um, and then of course, how serious the consequences of a particular contravention might be. So I talked about foundations earlier on as being kind of something that uh, let's look at the ground. Obviously, obviously, work in the ground is a key thing because it's our it's our foundation going up. Um, but that uh, everything that's a particular issue, fire stopping is is obviously another huge one at the moment, on the back of some of the issues we had. And then the 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 the, the, uh, the issue of closed up work. Um, the services engineers are are getting caught out with this one because they, and I've seen this in a lot of projects they. They're being asked now to go and look at things, and they're being caught out because they've been told things are being closed up, and they're like, "Oh, we have to go and see it now." And they're not that used to, to going and seeing things on a, on, a, on a periodic on a periodic basis, you know. And then obviously the speed of construction, and methods of fast track construction. We've got rapid build projects, and um, fast track is a word now. Hotels being were being built with uh, pod construction and all this sort of stuff. 
one sense pods will be made in factories and you know you think it would guarantee better construction but uh, not always and then does the assigned certifier or someone need to go to the factories to do the inspection so what is an inspection plan so it's a formal written plan of the inspections but it's written down so we can see it uh, in terms of the, the, the structural end, end of things to identify the tests that might be required from your structural specification if you go through all the various parts of the structural specification there's lots of tests that are needed there's lots of tests that probably don't get done but are, are called up in structural specifications um, cube tests tend to get done but when you look at all the other like I've gone through structural specifications to see it and there's loads of things in there and not, they're, not always, they're not always identified, they're not always done. And it's easy to say, well, they're there, you know, if we need them. But if they're there, why aren't they being used? Uh, so identify <laughs> elements to be closed in, as I said, uh, like reinforced concrete. Then the inspection plan is owned by the assigned certifier. I think this is the key, the key part. Is this inspection plan might be built by all the various people feeding into it. But the ownership of that inspection plan is with the assigned certifier. And the day track it periodically. Um, that everyone is carrying out and keeping records of inspections. Um, said to Damien earlier on, like what I want as an assigned certifier is inspections that tell me what I need to know. I don't want a 40 page report with photographs of that wall and that wall and that <coughs> wall. I'd rather just get a report to say I was on site, there was no issues in here, here and here, however an issue was identified here and this is what has to be done. One page. Because it tells you Everything was okay except something, and that's what you can track. So it's about the, 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 the quality of the, the inspections and the reports as well. And there's the use of modern com computer uh, aids. Most people now have tablets and things, and you can take photographs and upload your report straight away from site. And that's been a great help to this, to, to this role particularly. But then the key thing is that the non-conformances are identified and then tracked to resolution. Um, that's what our inspection plans do. There's inspections, uh, non-conformances identified, and they're brought right across to a to a checkbox. So all those checkboxes have to be filled, ticked to say yes. All anything that was identified has been has been resolved. And if anything is still open, then <coughs> you you, you're not going to get certification at the end. And then one of the key things is inspection and reporting by contractors. Um, I've asked for reports, and they're looking at you going, "I have to inspect stuff." So yeah, it's your work. And some of them are some of them are some of them are taken on board fantastically. Some of the bigger contractors are were even are nearly even way ahead of some of the professionals in this case, um, and they've bought into to, to BIM and they've bought into their their iPads on site and all that sort of stuff. But ninety ninety percent of them are way behind. You know, they think well, I have to do an inspection. Um, oh Jesus! <coughs> and then really the, the key, is, as I said, is following up and signing off on the non-conformances, whatever that might be, and it could be rebar and the beams upside down or whatever the case may be or it could be something in terms of fire stopping so just in terms of the certification the certification now is 100% compliant we used to have the term substantially compliant it doesn't exist anymore we have the ancillary certificates and um, there's a suite of them um, for architects engineers building <coughs> surveyors and for specialists uh, but for engineers, the key ones are ED, EC, and EI. So the ED is the form that's signed by the engineer prior to commencement to certify that his design is compliant. Uh, we have the EC, which the engineer signs at completion to say his design is compliant. <coughs> and we have the EI, which the engineer signs at the end to say he has inspected the works in accordance with his preliminary inspection plan. And the ancillary certificates, which came from the professional bodies, the RAI, uh, ACAI, uh, RIAI, and Society of Charter Surveyors, link what you're doing back to your conditions of engagement. Okay, so the key thing is that you have conditions of engagement, because that's what you're working to. And the wording of the certificates say that you exercise reasonable scare, kill, sorry, skill, care, and diligence. And these were, that was some of the changes that were brought in from the uh, from SI80 to SI9. But really, those uh, those three things are something that we all have to do, and what we do: skill, care, and diligence. 
Uh, one of the other key, key things of the, the ECERTs is that the design has been carried out by or under the supervision and direction of chartered engineers. So while the assigned certifier needs to be chartered engineer or registered professional um, and the design certifier does, the ancillary certs also have to be carried out under the supervision of chartered service to, to sign that to sign that ED cert and the EC cert. Um, there is the specialist cert as well, the, S, the SD, the SC and SI, which are for people who are not um, registered. But you then have to demonstrate as, as part of that cert what your what your um, what the backup for that is. Wh why are you a specialist? Um, and there's some there's 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 I've seen on different projects where different different people have asked for different things in terms of who signs what. Um, we had the case earlier on. We we're talking about a piling contractor. So does the, does the piling contractor sign the subcontractor CIF form, or does he sign the specialist designer cert? Uh, if he brings in someone to sign it, maybe he should be getting the company to sign the design cert as a designer, and he'll sign it as a as a subcontractor. And that's what we that's what I've seen happen on one case, but I've also seen it done differently. Um, but that's the way I would do it in that case. Um, and then just in terms of the EI cert, uh, this is the word, this, this, it's, it's, it's shortened in, but coordinating and integrating designated elements of the works as were designed by specialist suppliers and or subcontractors. So that's where you take in the, as a structural engineer, the, the, the piles and the precast elements and the timber, fabricated timber elements. And then your inspection plan or what you've inspected is in respect of the elements designed and specified by you. So you might have done an inspection, but you were only designing, sorry, you were only inspecting the works you designed, even if you are sitting in the meeting trying to influence them on the colour of the carpet. And then you undertake and you certify on your inspections. And I've done fees in brackets there because I think that goes back to your, t your, your uh, original conditions of engagement. When you're feeing your project, you really need to be thinking ahead and saying, well, what's my inspection plan going to be like? Because if I'm building up an inspection plan to do inspections at all these all these various things, am I going to get feed for it? Am I going to get paid for it? Um, because if you don't get paid for it, chances are you won't do it. And then there'll be another argument. So just a couple of um, case studies. This is number one, Falls Bridge. Uh, you see it as you're going down to the Aviva. Um, this is a very interesting one. We're doing the assigned certifier on the basement. Okay. Started construction in 2012 or 13, I think, <coughs> um, because they had a planning application that ran out in 2014, early 2014. So they built it up, 11 stories, piled it, and then they built the superstructure. And then they went in in 2000, mid 2014 to start, um, sorry, uh, earlier this year, sorry, earlier early 2015, to do top down construction. So they're digging out the basement as we speak. But because the way it went through building control was they applied for a fire cert for what they were going to build. So they met the fire officer. The fire officer said, yeah, yeah, well, do give me a fire cert, but I just wanted it for everything above ground. So that was back in 2012 or 13. So they did. <coughs> and they got a commencement notice for everything above ground. But then when they went to build the basement in 2015, BCAR had come in. So they had to do a fire cert for the, and they had to do, still had to do a fire cert for the basement. Once they had to do a fire cert for the basement, they needed a new commencement notice. So we think it's the only one like it in the country, and I can be I can be uh, found wrong, but uh, it's basically split right at ground level. So the existing ground floor slab is in, and everything below that, bar the piles, is under B car, and everything above it is under the old regime. Um, and we did. We spoke to the we spoke to, we met the building control officer before we even lodged commencement for the basement, and he kind of said, "Would you not just do the whole thing?" True B car, and uh, I was like, no. <laughs> so, because I mean, it's 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 mixed use. There's, there's apartments and all sorts of stuff in there. I don't know, I can't remember how many apartments there are, but he would have had to do all the apartments through it, so they didn't want to do it. <coughs> so that's an interesting one. So we're involved in that at the moment. Um, Chris Bacala is the structural engineer on that. Uh, the rapid build schools. This is another very interesting one. Design and build, um, and there's been issues in rapid builds before. Uh, obviously, design and build. It's, it's been they been it's been designed, and I, like all the comp all the contractors are big contractors. All the all the consultants are big consultants. Um, but again, as I said earlier on, this is rapid build. People are trying to build these things as fast as they can. 
But in this case, this is one where the assigned certifier role has been taken out. Um, so the, 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 the design and build contractor has his design um, team sitting underneath him. They're going to do design certifier. They're going to design it all. But we're the assigned certifiers and we sit on the other side. We sit on the, on the, on the department side um, with, the, with the technical, um, technical team. <coughs> so the process to this is key, setting out a process through, ten, through the tender process for what they have to do, how they have to comply, um, to make sure that they have their coordinators, to make sure that they understand their role as design certifier. So we're going through tender on that at the moment. Um, and to be fair, the, 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 the returns from, from the, the, the DMB teams were, were very good in terms of BCAR. This is, I just thought this was an interesting one I said, I just mentioned it. Uh, the Jehovah Witnesses, um, they built Kingdom Halls all over the country. But they're built by volunteers. They're also, de they're also designed by volunteers. So everything is volunteer. They throw them up in a couple of weekends. <coughs> um, so they approached us um, in 2014 and said, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this? And we sat down with them and we, 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 we risk assessed it. Like we talked to them out and we said, well, what do you do? Like who, who, who does what? And um, we went back and forth and we trashed it all out with them. And we, we came in with them. We said, well, we'll work with you. Um, we can see what you're trying to do. And maybe it was a risk. We said we'd, we said we'd take it on and, and, and uh, you know, work, work with them and try and assess the risk and try and minimize the risk. <coughs> um, so this is one we did where they took it even a, a step further because they had, they had traditionally done timber frame, um, which at least then you were pulling in a subcontractor who was going to give you design, but they decided to go. Well, let's try ICF. So they've gone ICF. So we had to, we had to look at the risks on that one then as well. So that was a specialist contract design for that. But again, I mean, they were feeding into that. There was ICF. There was timber <coughs> the trust companies, and um, they were they were they were able to back up the various elements. Um, but ultimately, they took they took it. They took that on the role, the, the, so the role of the building owner and the role of the builder was actually fulfilled by the client. So in terms of, the, as I said, the risk assessment we had to do, we had to be very careful mm -hmm. of what they were what they were saying to us. You know, uh, and then just one, just to throw in housing developments, um, projects that were started pre-boom. Um, you know, they're kind of half half built. Some houses are part constructed. What do you do? How? Um, we had instances there where. Some some of the structure was in the ground, foundations, rising <coughs> walls, floors were in the ground, um, and then they were trying to upgrade part L. They were trying to can we make can we make our cavities bigger? And they were asking the structural engineer, oh, can we do some of our cavities there? You know, um, and they just didn't want to take anything out. Like they just wanted to use it. Like how much is the foundation going to cost? But they still wanted to use it. And um, so part L was a key issue there, the structural issues. The design was certified by the Arctic, but again, it's about <coughs> assessing the risk. And then for houses in particular, the subcontractors' roles, um, sitting down with the subcontractors and asking them exactly what they're going to do. And then I suppose just on houses, one of the key things with houses is the individual completion. So what the guidance out there at the moment is, if you're going to do, say you've got 200 houses in the state, you're not going to lodge in a commencement notice for 200 houses because no one's going to build 200 houses and have them all sold in, in, in three or four months' time. So the guidance that's been given out by the local authorities is if you're going to build... 10 and try and sell 10, commence 10, but then you individually complete all of them. So each house has its own individual completion cert, um, which means it'll have its own individual inspection plan. <coughs> so there's a lot of paperwork when, when you start looking at um, when you start looking at individual houses, there's a lot of paperwork. So just to finish, there's the last thing, the last two slides, just some of the teething problems that uh, we've seen over the last 18 months. Um, at the start, it was an authorised use of the details on the building control management system. People were just going, oh, I want to do something. Who do I know a chartered engineer? Oh, come work me, I'll put him in. And they're putting people's names down against them and trying to start projects. Um, and that didn't last very long because they copped on and they brought in a, a method of um, accepting the role through emails. So now you get an email to your email address and you accept the role online. So they, they, they put that one to bed fairly quickly. Uh, phasing of works, you know, part occupation, or as I mentioned, <laughs> housing units, how you actually c uh, complete works. Um, we had we've had projects where we've tried to phase works and complete it and the question the question that came up was well is the phase fully compliant on its own and we had one instance where we tried to finish i can't remember what it was but there was no uh, accessible toilet in that phase so it wasn't considered compliant because there was no accessible toilet so it didn't actually meet part m 
so they just had to wait and finish up the whole thing. Um, the 40 square meter rule uh, that was resolved in the, in the latest regulations. The building control authority is actually getting used to the system and delays. Um, I had one local authority uh, submitted a completion cert to, and he said, "Oh yeah, he rang." I, I, did, I rang him to say it was going into him, and he said, "Oh yeah, I should have that tomorrow." You know, 21 days, great. One day, super. Three days went by. I rang him again. He said, "Oh yeah, I've just have a few things I have to sort out." I think it took him two weeks, and he actually told me afterwards. He said, "Oh, I was just ringing Fingal. They, they're they're leaving the whole thing. I just had to ask Fingal some questions." So he wanted, to, you know. So he was just learning what he was doing. It's probably his first one. Um, the knowledge base and the resources then of the building control authorities. Um, some of the some of the some of the local authorities are are, are well um, resourced, but some of them aren't. Um, some of them are only learning. Some people like some of the building control officers were just put into that role. Oh, this 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 thing is coming. Let's put someone in there. There you go. There's the regulations. Go and learn them. Um, so that th there's 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 a knowledge base that needs to develop in the in the local authorities as well. And I know they're doing a lot of work. We were chatting earlier on there. There's there's a lot of work going on in within the local authorities that they're they're trying to ramp up, but. Um, some of them do have catching up to do. Uh, so the designers and contractors getting used to their obligations, that was a huge thing. Um, they, they, they didn't really see it coming and didn't really see that they were going to have such a big part in it. And as I say here, particularly the subcontractors getting used to their obligations. And then just a lack of understanding generally across projects of what people had to do. Um, and on some projects they're still there. Um, we might be not quite back to, to boom times yet. But there's 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 some companies out there who who, you know, say architects who might have been doing a lot of feasibility work, and even eighteen months on, they they come. Oh, I haven't actually gone through a project yet using BCAR. What do I have to do? Um. So if they haven't been involved in it, they, they won't know. Um. We had public sector contract delays at the start, two thousand and fourteen. There was loads of projects went on hold because they didn't know what they had to do. They tendered projects that didn't have BCAR, and then they had to bring it in. We were involved in some schools projects. They didn't know what to do. They had to go off, and there was there was there was uh. There was um, cost overruns then because of it, and then of course the question of the one-off house and direct labour is that allowed? It is now. It's written down, written down in the new legislation. So what have we learned? Uh, I suppose we learned that the building control system is not just fire safety certs and DACs. There's a lot more to it than that. There's a, there's a, there's a lot behind it all. We've learned the reason for commencement notices, so that we can put a system in place where the local authority can can uh, carry out their risk assessments and they know what's going on and there's a method of tracking what's happening in terms of building control. I think we've learned the powers of the building control officers. Um, five years ago, if you were involved in a project, most people probably knew the fire officer's name or if you know if you're, if you're doing a lot of work in a certain area, you probably knew the fire officer's name because you know it came up in projects and oh yeah, he's, he's tricky or whatever. Now we're gonna start learning the building control officer's names and nobody knew them maybe a couple of years ago. They, People doing DACs started to get to know the building control officers and realised there was somebody there who did building control. But now, the building control officers are becoming a person that you have to deal with regularly. I think we still need to learn the value of design. Um, I think that's just something that in the industry, clients need to understand the, the value of the design that we all do as professionals. Um, and I think inspection is key to achieving quality. Um, that's throughout everything that we talked about, that's just the key thing to it. Uh, so the industry stakeholders still need education. Um, I think there's still not an industry standard for the role of a science certifier. Obviously I've been looking at, I've been looking at what other people are doing, um, <coughs> both people who are architects and other engineers who are doing it as part of a design team or people who are doing it as a third party independently or people who have taken it on um, just, just to do it and I'm going to do it a certain way. But there's a minimum work approach versus the, top, the, the, the over the top approach. There's the people who are just saying, right, all we have to do is sign a bit of paper here. And that's the minimum. And then you've got the people over the top approach who are like, we want to see every single screw on every single wall and picture of everything. And I think it's somewhere in the middle. And it's based on what I said before, risk assessment. One person, probably best to be a third party assigned certifier, sits down as part of the team, carries out that risk analysis we spoke about before and says, what do we really need to do on this? And ultimately I think that'll lead to better building. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, um, thank you for brought the clarity to uh, when you kicked off explaining the difference in building regulations and building control regulations. And, uh, and I think I remember the episode of 
Macmillan and White, where he sent the young copper down to City Hall for the plans of the building. And the back of the twenty minutes. I don't know. But it was a good time. Um, uh, we any questions? A lot of them, certainly on the, s on the smaller scale projects, just see the cost. They don't see the value, and they just see the cost. Um, I think as, pro as the projects get larger and the, 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 the type of clients you're dealing with, they, they do see, the, they see, they do see the, the value in it, you know? Um, so the public sector clients and much, much kind of people who, are people who are professional developers, let's say. <coughs> but, um, People doing kind of small projects like restaurant fit outs where you're actually dealing with the, the restaurant tour, for example. Um, just they just see it as red tape. Obviously with the the, the, the one off house builder as well, like that's that's where this whole change in the regulations came. Um, they they certainly don't see the value in it. But then there's 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 people who do, like um, I was speaking to the the site no, what are the, the self builders, there's a guy down in Kerry or Cork. He's the self builders and I had a good conversation with him about just, just to inform myself what, what they were saying, you know. And the issue I have is that people who say join a, a self builder group are probably really into it. You know, they want to build a really good house. And they're not the people I'm worried about. It's the people who don't want to join that and who just want to build what what they, what they want to build and just don't care, like and who, who think they know better. Um and that's fine. And they say, Oh, but I'm building on my father's land and I'm gonna live in this for 40, 50 years. It's fine, but that's what happened um, in the boom times, and they're the people who lost those houses, and they're the houses we've been looking at for the banks for the last six years that are absolutely horrendously built, you know, and are not worth half of what they thought they were worth, or what the banks are. So the banks have assets now that are worthless nearly places and times, you know. But yeah, I suppose to sum up, the, the, a lot of the smaller banks don't don't see the value. Um, in relation to the, the exchange with the opt out. Mm. for the one-off and for the extensions. Um, even though you opt out, there's still a requirement for you to demonstrate to the building code officer that you're fully compliant with mm. the regulations. How do you see that working? How do you see the, the reaction of building code officers? Will they be, shall we say, seeking the same level of crime and information as we normally have applied, yeah. in which case there's a no-cost reduction? The only thing you're not... The only thing you're not doing is you're not assigning someone as the assigned certifier. The way I see it is, and the way I have said, I mean, we we, we have a few clients who, who had we had given quotes to, and I said, yeah, you can opt out, but <coughs> I don't see that you're going to save anything, because if I stay involved, I'm still going to have to do the same level of inspection to certify the house, you know? Um, so I don't see <laughs> there really being a huge thing. I mean, people are saying, oh, I'm saving five grand, way. I, I don't see how they do that, because they, as you say, they have to do the design, Someone has to do that. Someone's going to still have to inspect it, or else if they'll have a house that's not inspected at all. Is the completion cert to be opted out the short form? There is none. As far as I can, as far as I know, there's no completion cert. So the continuing compliance back to the old system. Yeah, that's my understanding. That's yeah. So ultimately, I think the banks are going to drive this. The mortgage lenders are going to drive this. So the only guy who's going to be able to do something with this is the guy with three hundred grand in his back pocket who says, oh, "I'll just build myself in my own field." It'll be grand, but everything else is going to be driven by the mortgage lenders, okay. you know, or uh, mortgage lender and or solicitors if they get their act together as well. You know, that's that's the way I see it going. I mean, I the, the few I saw, uh, the mortgage um, or the bank's papers, like they they look for stage stage payments. The language on those forms now is a signed certifier. So are they going to change back? They're going to be the banks are going to be going looking for um, legal advice on what they should be doing. And where do they go? They go back into limbo if they change that, you know. So I don't think they will. So this, uh, it's long lost there, Tom. Is it fair to say that the building control officers still have the same powers of requesting information and oh, inspection, yeah. regardless of where yeah. they opted out? Well, like I mean, the, the 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 minister said he was going to engage with the the, the city city and county managers, <coughs> uh, effectively to to resource up the the building control officers so they can take they can step in, um, but they've said. They've said that they, they didn't want this to happen either. So they're going to have to decide now, are they going to you know, use their 12 and 15% inspections and particularly focus on those houses? Um, and in, 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 in Dublin, for example, that might be quite hard. I mean, you've got you know, over half of the country living in the city. 
I mean, and to be honest, with you the housing stock that we have in Dublin is 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 pretty poor. Um, and as, as as property changes hands now, if you find like if you go through any of the kind of typical nineteen seventies estates, houses sell. They're being renovated straight away, and most of those houses are being extended because they don't meet the needs of the families at the moment. So we have this big kind of boom of of these four bedroom houses being extended and renovated. Um, <coughs> if, the, if the building control authorities have to go and look at every single one of them, they're going to be under resourced again. Sorry, Carl, but just on that, I mean, inspections by building control officers, you know, they'd be discreet, whereas your assigned certifier would be a continuous inspection. So you're not going to get the overall picture yeah. of the house. You might get a foundation check, yeah. but the rest is. That's it, yeah. So just a couple of questions. So in effect, with the, with the opt-out scenario, could a homeowner like just get a draft contract, for example, to get planning permission, and then the homeowner just goes off and does that build for the extension or whatever with no inspection? And then the second question is, with the opt-out, um, will, will the minister then be likely to turn around and blame the banks for, for forcing people to get to come under the beach trap? It is a political stunt, uh, stunt I think. Um, everybody told them not to do it. Right, everybody. Engineers Ireland, RAI, the local authorities. There's nobody, uh, bar maybe that guy down in Kerry, wherever he is, the, 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 the home builders group or whatever he calls himself. But <coughs> everybody else told the minister not to do it. All the professional guidance in the country was don't do it, don't change it. Uh, even even though there was there was lots of you know negative things being said about the whole process when it actually came to it and the review was happening and if you go through all the, the, the submissions that were made um, because people had ideas what could be tweaked but everyone said don't change it so he went ahead and changed it and I can't understand myself from a political point of view what he gained by it because how many people can build a one, can build a one-off house anyway <laughs> the numbers in terms of votes are so small but he thought it was a big issue out there and, in the, and he's, he's from a rural background so that's that's where it came up um, your first question in terms of the, 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 the getting the design done, y yes, they, they can, but whether they're going to be compliant or not is another thing. That's it, yeah. You know, you, you still have, as, as we said here, you still have to comply with the regulations. You still have to demonstrate that. So you still have to submit your drawings to the Building Control Authority. So it, it will depend somewhat on what level the Building Control Authority decide, decide to look at that. Um, like for new houses now, I think the checklist that they're using in local authorities is, is getting better. So for example, um, Part L compliance report, you know, a, an actual compliance report out of deep, that's something they're looking for now as, an, <coughs> as, as nearly a minimum. Um, whereas before, maybe that wouldn't have been even been considered. Um, so a good set of GA drawings, um, a set of details, just to see, see that there is a set of drawings there that, that show this. Um, a deep calculation, and then if they look reasonable enough, maybe there's enough. They they they, they look at it and say, "Oh, well, in risk space, and it looks like someone put some thought into it." But if you're literally just getting your planning drawings being lodged in <coughs> as compliance drawings, you know, the, the depending on what the building the building authority, the building <coughs> uh, control officer does, but he might just send that back and say, "There's not enough detail there." Sorry, then just uh, can you explain then the process for a one-off house? Then if you if you've not got the people or not that what's the route then? They, they, st they still have to go through the BCMS <coughs> system, <coughs> yeah. So you still have to do a commencement notice, and as part of your commencement notice, now you you still have to fill out the risk assessment. So you still have to tell the local authority what you're doing, how you're building it. So if you're, you know, you get asked the same questions, you get asked method of construction, so is timber frame, whatever. Um, but then instead of instead of say the, the paperwork for the assigned certifier and all that, you lodge this form opting out. So you sign the form and say I'm opting out. But you still have to assign your builder. But you can, and it's written down now that you can assign yourself as the builder if you are doing, a, say, a self-build. You know, but like for self-builds, we did a couple of self-builds just to see how it went. Uh, we did one, one of the ones on the Dermot Bannon show on the TV as well, just to see how that went as well. Um, but again, for me, it was sitting down with the guy building the house and saying, "Do you know what you're doing?" Um, and in that case, he had taken on a project manager. So while he was signing the form, there was a project manager who had worked with us before. So in terms of risk, we knew the guy, we knew what he could do. Um, 
and we knew who his subcontractors were. So really, we were setting like a chain down, so we knew who everybody was. Um, but it's it's now now that's gone, you know. The sales builder just signed, puts himself down. That's it, you know. He's there's there's no real chain. He can do what he likes after that because he's the one kind of tracking everything, you know. And that's that's the bit that scares me, that people can put themselves down and just off they go, you know. Just in relation to self build and outcome, both self build and both how to self build and um, contractor build, I've actually found in some cases self build <coughs> is easier or safer to do because the guy is relying on you and giving you information about the subbies. Whereas with the contractors, you could have one sub in one day and the following day it's someone completely different because they fall in love with them. Mm -hmm. So you have no level of, of control over who the builder has in. Yeah. So that becomes a good, difficult. It's a good point because that, I mean, that's, that's why. why I haven't. The people look at me when I say self they're like, oh, jeez. <coughs> I said, but I've sat down with the guy and he's he's relying on me now. And okay, ultimately, when it's signed off, I'll have signed a bit of paper. But I know, I, I, I was there, I went through that project. Um, and I, I probably won't do too many of them because they don't make it, you don't make any money at them. But, but they're a great process to go through, you know? Um, and you, you end up working through with an architect and you end up working through with subbies and project managers and what happens. So it was a good process to go through, especially at the start of it all. Um, but um, yeah, I think that if, if you if professionally you can sit back at the end and say I'm happy with that house, well then that's 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 how you should feel, you know. Any more questions before we wrap it up? Cormac, and um, one of the one of the things I find that takes a lot, an awful lot more time, not an awful lot more time now when some feedback came in is assessing in accordance with Part D of the building notes, so material specifications, mm -hmm. workmanship, and you spend a lot of time you <coughs> going through contractor proposals. Yeah, and yeah. Huge, yeah. And uh, like a lot, of, a lot of what you see is, is so generic as well. Like, um, like you mentioned, inspection and painting or, or, or fire stop and stuff. Like, you just get brochures. Yeah. There's the brochure for the fire stop we're using. Like, where are you using it? Yeah. You know, show, show us what you're actually doing. You know, put it on the drawing. Yeah. You know. It's almost like you need to do the work for them. Yeah. See the exactly. Yeah. The yeah. In terms of the plans and the specifications and the work that you need. But like that's that that's developing as well. I mean, now you see that there's a specialist. You know, there's specialist fire stopping companies are, are, are they're, they're cropping up everywhere now. There was a, there was a handful of them out there, but now they're cropping up everywhere. And their sister, you know, the guy used to work for someone's set up his own company, but they're bringing good systems. Um, and like what was a serious issue um, seven, eight years ago in terms of fire stopping <coughs> is actually now probably one of the best tracked things in construction because of the issues we had seven or eight years ago. So now you're getting drawings from, from these specialist fire protection guys with, you know, details shown of all the fire stuff and then the locations of them and then you go inside and they're all marked and they're all cross-referenced to a drawing you know that's fantastic you know but that's only coming because of the issues we had before